Hi, my name is David Carruthers. Um, I'm the guy who put together this journal uh, called Daily Transformation. And the one I'm holding in my hand is actually written in Spanish because uh, I'm speaking to you uh, from uh, Planeta Rica, Colombia, where we're getting a chance to help brothers and sisters here uh, in three or four churches around the area so that they might be able to quickly make disciples by sharing Jesus with them and then training them to start home churches so that they in turn will make more disciples and start home churches. And what I wanna share with you today is how we can share our faith very simply in a new tool that I learned last September. It's not new for everybody, but it's new for me. It's found in the fourth section of this journal uh, called Express in English. And it's about how do we express our faith in Jesus. You see, many people know that Jesus Christ died on the cross but not everyone knows why. I learned this method from a guy named Augie Martin, who's part of No Place Left. He was invited to help train a, a group of Latin American pastors at the Church Multiplication Coalition Conference, the Latin American Conference last September. I was a part of that. I was listening to it in Spanish. My Spanish is very old, so I could understand very little. But as he drew the circles, I began to understand the power of this uh, method of sharing Jesus. In fact, it's so good that I removed it out of my initial draft of this journal uh, in, in order uh, to include it because God is using it mightily around the world. So let me share with you uh, how I might share Jesus using the three circle method. As I talk to people, whether it's on an airplane where I get a lot of time with a person or, uh, or if I find that I'm in a space where people have time to talk, I might uh, direct the conversation to about their family and wanting to know, uh, you know, about each member of the family, about where they live, where they grow up, and eventually ask them about uh, what did they go to church when they were growing up. And many people have some exposure, maybe once in a lifetime. Sometimes people are very faithful in a particular denomination, but it's okay. I want to share this with every kind of person I meet because there's two kinds of people that you'll meet every day. The first kind of person that you're going to meet is a person that knows Jesus. And that person needs to be trained to follow Jesus. They need to be a disciple maker. The second kind of person you meet is a person who doesn't know Jesus, but they need to be introduced to Jesus. And then in turn, when they accept him, train others to follow Jesus. And so I treat every person with respect as I show this because I don't know where they are in their journey with God. And they be, be very religious and they may know a lot of Bible verses already. So, so the question is, is do they know Jesus? And if they do, I need to train them to do this so that way they'll share it with their family and friends. And if they don't know Jesus, I want them to tell me that so that they might pray to know Jesus at that time. So let me share with you how I share Jesus with someone when I have a little bit of time. I first begin by asking them, do they have a sheet of paper uh, and a pen? Uh, many times people can rummage through their purse or they have uh, their backpack with them and they can find a piece of paper. Sometimes I've actually torn a back page out of a, a book I was reading that happened to be handy. Sometimes I have to ask a waitress for a piece of paper. Uh, all sorts of situations uh, have happened. You'll have your own. And we get a pen. And the reason why I'm asking for the piece of paper is because I'm going to draw what I'm, what I'm going to share with you. I'm going to draw on this piece of paper and I want them to keep it. And, uh, and I'm going to ask some personal information later so that they can use it to apply it in their life. And so they need to know that that's their piece of paper. It's not going to be mine. So I might ask, so many people know that Jesus died on the cross. They just don't know why. Let me share with you why. We live in a world that is broken. It's cracked. You might use like an egg or like a plate, it's broken. We all see the brokenness. And I ask him, how have you seen that the world is broken? And we get all sorts of answers. They'll say, well, I see war, I see natural disasters, I see drug addiction, I see human trafficking, I see broken families, I see families who bring, family members who, because of their poor choices, bring shame to the rest of the family. We all know and see brokenness. Every single person I've ever talked to agrees that this world is broken. And then I tell them, you know, that's not the way God made this world. God made this world as a place to love us. I talk about look outside. 
I mean, look at the greenery, look at the beauty when you look out a window and you can see that God went to great effort to make the place where we live a place of beauty. Like a parent, he, he, we would wanna make sure that we could provide the best home that's safe for our family, that's beautiful, as much as we could do with our income. God has no income limitations. And he made an amazing place for us to live because he loves us. Now, we have also all had an experience where perhaps we're walking on a road, we're, we're hiking in a mountain, we're at the beach and we're by ourselves, And in that moment, we feel a breeze come by and we might sense peace, and we might sense love just for a moment, and it feels good, doesn't it? And I say, you know, that is a remnant of the love of God that he has for us. We've all experienced it. And you need to know, as I'm sharing this with you, that every single person I've ever talked to has had that experience. So then I ask him, how do we get from this broken world back to this sense that we know that God loves us and that we're in a restored relationship with him. Because right now we're trying a lot of different things to try to feel better about this world because we see how broken it is and we want it to be a better place for ourselves and for our family and friends. So how do we fix this? And so I asked him, what are some good things that we do to try to make this world a better place? And you know, I, I, I hear all sorts of wonderful answers. Answers that God wants us to do. For instance, a person said to me one time, I want a family. And I say, beautiful. Notice that the line is squiggly. It's squiggly because it's broken. You know, it just doesn't work. I I don't need to explain that. I just do that right now. They'll they'll get it in time. And say, yeah, we we want a family. If we had a family, then we could love them and we could have a sense of purpose. One one young person was an 18-year-old girl at a birthday party uh, in in, uh, Cartagena, Colombia, who said that. And when I was asking that, her boyfriend was sitting right next to her. I don't know if they were official yet. I I think that they were really uh, liking each other, but they weren't admitting it to each other. But I asked him what he what he thought we could do, he would do to make this world a better place. And he said, I want an education. I said, oh, that's good. Yeah, if you have an education, get a good education, then then you could get a good job. And if you've got a good job, then you'll be able to provide for your family. Maybe maybe have your own home one day that you own and maybe have a vacation or two in a lifetime something special like that, right? And then I asked them, well, what else? And they said, well, we need to give to the poor. I said, oh, that's good. Did you know that God wants us to have a family? He made us man and woman that we might be a family one day and we could raise children. Do you know that he wants us to have a job to make a difference in this world, to help other people and to be responsible? Do you know that God wants us to help those who are poor? These are all things God wants us to do. These are good things but they're broken because they're happening in this broken world. Let me give you an example. We say, well, we put our hope in having a family one day, but the truth is that sometimes we have a child that's born with a defect, or sometimes our our spouse does something that's very painful or hurtful, or our child grows up to make a poor decision. We have family members right now that perhaps are doing things that are bringing shame on us. We've got an aunt or an uncle struggling with an addiction. So what do we do? It's, it's, very, it's very hard. We, we, we're stuck in life because it's broken. And then you think about that job. You go to school and you work really hard to get a good job and you, you get hired by a boss who doesn't pay you what he promised. Or, or perhaps you have a client that doesn't give you the wage that, uh, for a project that they had promised that you both agreed upon. And sometimes we work in a work environment where we work hard to have a good reputation, to show our good work ethic, but we have coworkers who become jealous and try to strip us of our good reputation. See, these are all good things, but they're broken because we live in a broken world. Sometimes we do things to escape the pain that we feel because we all feel this. And so sometimes we, we turn to drugs. We turn to alcohol because we try to escape. Sometimes we actually turn to sex as a way to feel loved, to feel like we're wanted. But when it's outside of marriage, Afterwards, we usually feel betrayed and hurt, and we know it doesn't really solve our problems. So what do we do? We live in a broken world and want to get here. But the Bible says there's a problem. There's a wall. There's a wall that separates us, that keeps us from getting to this world. Do you know what that wall is? 
I ask them. And do you know that most people know whether they go to church or not? Sometimes they need a little coaching, like the word starts with S and ends with N with a vowel in the middle. Uh, but it's sin. You probably already thought of it before I said it. And I said, that's right. Sin separates us from God. In fact, the Bible says this, and I usually include Bible verses because it's good for people who are religious to know that all that I'm sharing with them is from the scripture and they can look up later. After all, this is their piece of paper. They can go home and look it up. And so I put Romans 3.23 and 6.23 on the piece of paper. And I say in Romans 3.23, it says that everybody has sinned. Everybody has sinned. And I ask him, who does that leave out? Nobody. Right? So that means that you've sinned and I've sinned. Everyone has sinned except Jesus. Second of all, this verse in Romans 6.23 says this, that the wages of that sin is death. That's why this world feels like it's dying. Because it is. And it's why we have a sense of death on the inside. So what do we do? We're in a broken world, separated, and we're paying the wages of our sin, death. How could we possibly get here? Is there any hope for us? No, not on our own. There's no help. We needed God to rescue us. And in fact, do you see this heart here? God still loves us. His love is still there for you, I tell them. And so God created a plan, and I draw a third circle. And I said, God came to earth. He died on a cross, and three days later, rose again. When Jesus came, it was an act of love. In fact, it says this, and I write this next Bible verse down. Romans 5. Eight. In Romans 5, 8, it says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why would Jesus die? Because the wages of sin is death, and the only way that we could be forgiven is if someone paid it. You see, it was all part of God's plan. You know, if Jesus was just an ordinary man, right, uh, what good it would be for him dying on a cross? If I died for you, would that forgive your sins? If your parents died for you, it wouldn't forgive your sins. But God was paying the price. And you say, well, well, why did he let people treat him so cruelly? I mean, didn't they spit on him and pull out his beard and whip him with a cane and then flog him till his back was split open and then eventually kill him on a cross? Why did Jesus, if he is God and he is good and never sinned, why would he look like a failure to the world? Because of his plan. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. For us, you see, Jesus was opening a doorway from this broken world through him back to a restored relationship with the Heavenly Father, with him, and, 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 and that we might know that we have eternal life. That no longer do we have to worry about death. No longer do we have to worry about paying the penalty for our sins but Jesus has paid it for us. And so then I ask him, how do you do that? This is why Jesus died. Now you know he died for a reason, and here's how you get his gift. You need to make Jesus your king. How do you do that? Two things, repent and believe. And I get this from Romans 10, 9, and 10. In this verse, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? 
saved from this life of death here and eternal death in hell forever. He moved us through here. If we will do those two things, confess with our mouth that he is Lord, that is to repent. That is to declare that I am no longer Lord. I am changing from my current path and I'm turning towards God saying, you are my Lord. You say, I don't play God. Well, don't we? I mean, there are 10 commandments in the Bible, right? Most everybody knows that there are 10 commandments and they think they're reasonable commandments until they live their life. And they say, well, I don't use the Lord's vain, in, in, name in vain too much. I mean, only when I hit my thumb with a hammer or something, yeah, words come out. Yeah, I use the names of vain. It's, it's no big deal. Everybody does it. Oh, so now there's only nine commandments. We'll scratch that one off. Say, so, well, you know, and I, 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 I uh, really do like my neighbor's new car and I'm gonna work harder so I can get that car because that's the American way. I mean, that's what we do. We get ahead by seeing what other people want and we become competitive. But friends, that's being covetous. We, we're desiring what someone else wants. We're not being content. So we're really, when we live that way and call that normal, we're just scratching that kind of amount off too. So now we have eight. And then we look at our, our, our neighbor's spouse, man, woman, like, wow, they're really handsome. I'd love them. Mm, I can't say nothing. I'll never live that out. But Jesus says that if you lust in your heart, it is as though you've already committed the sin. Friends, that means now we've just scratched off another commandment. We're down to seven commandments. When we play God. But when we repent and turn from self-leadership to God's leadership, we're saying, Jesus, if you say there are 10 commandments, there are 10 commandments. Help me now live the life you've called me to live. So to confess that Jesus is Lord is to repent, to repent of self-leadership and to say, I want your plan for my life, Lord. I want to discover what you're doing. And then to believe, to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead is to declare that Jesus was actually God and dying on the cross for a reason. That reason was to pay the sin, the sin debt that I can't pay myself. So then I asked the person, looking at the two circles above, which one are you in right now? Do you feel like you're living in a world that is broken? Do you feel like that, that you uh, have, uh, you're trying to do your best to make it better, but, but there's this sense of death on the inside of you and that things aren't working? Or do you have a sense of peace with God that you know he is in control of things and then if you died tonight, you'd be in heaven? Do you know that? And I ask him to make a choice. Would you point to me at which circle you're in? Friends, people are honest and they'll tell you, don't be bashful about asking that question. I mean, you care about them. You love them enough to ask them that question. So they point. And sometimes I've had people say, well, I know this circle, but, I, but I'm living in this circle. I'm like, wow, okay, well, what's going on? And then they tell me, well, there's some sin that I'm doing and, and I know God doesn't approve. And then I usually ask him, so let me ask you, uh, uh, this one particular guy um, was a young lawyer and I said, so you said you want to have a family. What kind of family you want to have? What kind of wife do you want? He said, I, I, I want a godly woman. I said, that's good. So let me ask you, is a godly woman going to want to be with a guy who wants to hang out over here? Quality people, godly people, recognize godly people. You see? In fact, if you want to build your life apart from God and do what you want, do you know who gets to maintain that life? You do. But if you want God's life for you, what God builds, he maintains. So which life do you want? Well, that friend said, I want that life. I said, what do you need to do? And he said, I need to repent. And so he did. He repented right there in the steps going up to his apartment in Cartagena. It was really cool because I could see the transformation that took place on his face. And uh, afterwards I asked him, I said, how did you know this? How did you know this? Because you knew all these Bible verses. You were saying them with me. He said, because my papa's a pastor. And I said, would you do your father a favor? 
and call him tonight? Because he needs to know that his prayers for you have been answered today. See, remember, you're meeting two kinds of people every day. People that know Jesus and need to be trained to follow him. And people who don't know Jesus who need to be introduced to him and then trained to follow him, right? So the person who's a non, who doesn't know Christ, they will pray and uh, uh, they will, they will, they can, re you can lead them through a prayer to repent and believe. And, and they too can find the victory there is in the new life in Christ. Now, after the prayer, I would encourage you to share with them 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17 through 21. In that passage, it says this that you are now a new creation. God has made you brand new. All of Jesus' righteousness has been imparted to you, and, and your old life can be a part of your past. He has made you new. That's great hope. And the second part of that verse says that we are now his ambassadors. We get to, for God, Go to the broken world and help our family and friends who feel the death and brokenness take the same path you did through Christ to come and find a restored relationship with God. Isn't that cool? And I asked them, I said, let, let, in fact, let's take a moment right now. Oh, what's your name? And this particular guy's name was Dimitri if I remember correctly. So Dimitri, can you think of five friends or family members, people you love, that right now you're concerned that they're over here? You could be wrong. You don't know for certain, but you're concerned and you want them over here. Who are you concerned about? Give me five names. And I draw five radiuses, five rays, I'm sorry, off of that with a circle at each end. And we write it down and I remind them, this is your piece of paper. So I might be writing this right now, but I'm going to give it to you. Okay. And then mama, papa, don't no, not just not mom. Give me mom's name. And uh, so they give me names. I'll put my mom's name down. I'll put my stepfather's name down. I'll put my brother's name down because I can't remember Dimitri's. And then I got my next door neighbor. I'm concerned about his name is Brian. Right, and then maybe there's someone that, that I see um, at the store and uh, there's the cashier and I'm trying to remember her name right now, but I'll just say uh, uh, Susan, all right? So then I asked Dimitri, Dimitri, which of these five are you most concerned about right now? Which one just your heart is burdened for? Oh, my mama, okay. So why don't we pray right now that God would begin to prepare your mama's heart for you to be able to have this conversation where you can draw the same picture that I drew for you. And then after you draw that for her, would you have her do her circle and come up with her five friends that she's concerned about? So that way she's living in this new identity of being a new creation and ambassador for God. That's our job. We're to help. We're not just to share Jesus with people, but we're, all, we're to make disciples, right? And so they say, well, wait a minute. Disciples is just, is this the only thing of a disciple? And what do I do with, with my mom who just received Jesus? She's not ready to go to a Protestant church. She's not ready to do all that stuff. Well, you know what? You can do Bible study together. And then I share with them a simple method that I learned. This is a picture of a sword. And... When you look at a Bible passage, you ask four questions. What does this teach me about God? What does it teach me about man? Is there a sin to avoid? And is there a command to obey? Now, I like to do an introduction question. And the introduction question is, is there a verse that I really liked? Or is there one that created questions? And then you, of course, you need to always end with application. And so the question is, what is God asking me to do? 
let people pray and ask God. But if you do this, you've not only shared Jesus with them, you have shown them that they can go share their faith, what they've just learned, and now you can meet together as a group of friends and family learning the Bible together. I hope you found this helpful to you. God bless you, and I have other segments where you can watch and learn how to do a Bible study in, more great de in greater detail. We'll also talk more about prayer, uh, and we'll also uh, talk about how to do a daily quiet time to preserve your own walk with God. So look for those segments as well. Thanks.